Welcome to the Massachusetts Historical Society and to Monument Man, the life and art of Daniel Chester French. I'm Catherine Algor and I'm the president here at the Society. And as many of you know, the heart of the Society is our collection. We began collecting in 1791, which makes us, I think, the very first historical society in this hemisphere. And we've been collecting since then. We have 14 million items and they range from the extraordinary to the even more extraordinary. Um, the joy of our jobs is always finding ways to share um, these treasures with you all. And we have a particularly interesting way to do that this month. Um, we've opened our very first virtual exhibition. It couldn't be more relevant. It's called Who Counts? And it's a uh, history of voting rights through political cartoons. So do go to our website and take a look at that. And take a look at the other stuff that we have too. We have a wonderful blog there. We have um, an object of the month. And of course, we have that very, very important little support button, which allows you to make a, guess, uh, make a gift or better yet become a member. And I also want to say that we're getting ready for what we're calling the conversation of the century. So we're also having our very first virtual gala and it is November 17th. And it is going to be pretty spectacular. And the reason I'm thinking that it's going to be the conversation of the century, it's going to be a little bit after a certain election. And our speaker and moderator will be John Meacham as the primary speaker, our own Emily Rooney from GBH as the moderator. And I can just think it's going to be an electric conversation, very contemporary. So you can get um, a gala information there and tickets as well. But let's get started with tonight's program. So I'd like to... Um, Toss this over to my colleague, Gavin Cleespees. Gavin? Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for that wonderful greeting. Uh, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the program uh, this evening. Uh, my name is Gavin Cleespees. I'm the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships at the Massachusetts Historical Society. And I hope everyone is able to enjoy uh, the early fall weather. Uh, this evening, we are honored to host Harold Holzer, who serves as the Jonathan F. Fenton Director of Hunters College Roosevelt House uh, Public Policy Institute. He is one of the country's leading authorities on Abraham Lincoln and the political culture of the Civil War era. He served for six years as chairman of the Lincoln Bicentennial, Bicentennial Foundation, and for the previous 10 years, he co-chaired the commission. Professor Holzer is a prolific writer. Uh, the book he's speaking about this evening was released in 2019. Uh, and since it's been published, he's uh, released two new books. <laughs> uh, he is in total the author of 54 different books. Uh, this evening, uh, he's stepping slightly away from his, his usual topic. Um, and rather than talking about Lincoln, he'll be speaking about the sculptor who created the most famous rendition of Lincoln, Daniel Chester French. Uh, Monument Man explores the life of Daniel Chester French, America's best known sculptor of public monuments. Uh, it's the first comprehensive biography of this fascinating figure uh, and his illustrious career. Uh, and earlier this year, it was awarded the New England Society Book Prize. Professor Holzer will speak for about 45 minutes, and we will then uh, open the program for questions. Although we have close to 200 people signed on, so we might not get to every single one of them. So without further ado, I'm happy to welcome uh, uh, Harold Holzer. Thank you, um, Catherine and Gavin, for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to do this program because when the book about Daniel Chester French came out last year, I knew that I wanted to speak about it in Boston because uh, French's mark is as vivid in Boston as it is in Washington or New York or, or Concord. And uh, I'd like to get right to the images because the story of an artist is always in the images. Um, if we can go to the first slide, you'll see the, uh, the, the, a portrait of French with uh, a, a, a bust version of his most famous work, which uh, Gavin alluded to, a version of the Lincoln Memorial. And this is a painting created late in French's life. He lived into his early 80s. And um, the next slide will show you uh, what he looked like at the beginning of his life. Yes, this is uh, Daniel Chester French, complete in a dress and long curls. Uh, he was born in 1850. This photograph was made in the 1850s. 
um, aside from being adorable, it's kind of a marvel of early photography. It was very hard to get uh, children or any sitter really to smile in uh, daguerreotypes, tintypes, and ambrotypes. Yet this photographer allegedly did so by holding a bird uh, in front of the child. So here's little Dan, um, uh, who has by this point moved from New Hampshire, his birthplace, to Massachusetts. In the next slide, you'll see that he, he carried his bird uh, avocation forward. This is Dan with two of his early buddies, and they one of them remained a friend for life, William Brewster, the famous ornithologist also of Massachusetts. Uh, they were also hunters, as you see, but collected birds, stuffed birds, and uh, allegedly French could turn to Brewster for his entire life to provide bird wings that he could model for angel wings in his sculptures. Well, how did French manifest his early skill? I guess the usual way, he, he built New England snowmen uh, in Concord and uh, a frog he made out of a turnip, which he left on his father's plate one day to see if he could get a rise out of him. He did. Uh, he also went to MIT, uh, traveling from Concord on the train to Boston, where MIT was headquartered then on the other side of the river, but did pretty badly. Um, and he told his father, I don't want to go to college. I want to be an artist. So in the next group of slides, you'll see some of his early teachers. Um, Judge French, the sculptor's father, the future sculptor's father, was not certain that he should allow his son to be anything but a lawyer and judge. So he went to the local art teacher, um, May Olcott, who you see on the left, uh, the, the very person who had served as the model for Amy in Little Women. Um, she was the local drawing instructor. Judge French took his son to her and said, see if he has any skill um, before I invest my patience in his development. She reported back that he could indeed sculpt and was gifted enough to become a professional sculptor. So French went on, young French went on to study with John Quincy Adams Ward, great mid-century American sculptor who you see in the center, and William Rimmer, a drawing teacher out of Boston. Uh, French did not stay long in, the, in his class with Rimmer because he was the only boy in the class, and I suppose with raging hormones, he was not able to concentrate on his drawing. In the next image, you'll see uh, one of his early professional works. Uh, not great, but uh, very popular. In the manner of Rogers groups, he did uh, a crockery group, I guess, a parian group called matchmaking, uh, or the honeymooners, two owls spooning, I guess. And he sold it to the Clark Plimpton Company of Boston for $50. A, uh, a deal that he would regret for the rest of his life, especially when he became a denizen of European travel and saw this work in storefronts in London and Paris, much to his annoyance because he wasn't making money out of them. Um, the next slide will uh, show Dan as a, a young man of around 20, uh, lots of hair, which he later lost, something I sympathize with. And around this time, he received a career-making commission with no competition, uh, no formal call for proposals. His neighbors in Concord, including Emerson and others, wanted the local boy to get the commission to do a very important work, uh, the, uh, the Minuteman, which was to be... Uh, dedicated on the village green on the anniversary of the defense of the bridge of the North Bridge. Uh, well, he had never done a full length statue, so he kind of experimented. As you'll see on the next slide, he did some preparatory drawings. Uh, really the, the, the first and last time we have preparatory drawings from French, aside from using chalk drawings on blackboards, he became a sculptor ultimately who 
who went right to clay uh, from concept and didn't do many drawings like this. As you can see, he's got kind of a rudimentary view of the torsion of the legs of his yeoman farmer. And he didn't think he had it right. So he made many visits to see the Apollo Belvedere. In the next slide, you'll see the way it looked when he visited the Boston Athenaeum to study it. And um, from this minimal experience, minimal preparatory work came the work, as you'll see in the next slide, dedicated on April 19th, 1875, on a freezing Massachusetts spring morning, or maybe not quite spring. Oh yeah, I guess in April it would have been spring. And um, uh, a vast crowd of dignitaries, including Ulysses S. Grant, for this dedication of an acclaimed work. It made him famous overnight. And as you'll see in the next slide, it created a cottage industry in different versions and reductions of the Minuteman that he was to create really for the rest of his life. Well, where was young 25-year-old Daniel Chester French on dedication day? But the next image will, will give you a hint. He was not in Concord. Yes, he was in Florence with uh, this view from his window. He had decided to study abroad. He had taken up residence in Florence where he would work for more than a year. And when he got the invitation to the big dedication back in Massachusetts, I mean, it wasn't exactly as if he could go on a 747 and get there quickly, but he could have gone. But I think he was too nervous to do so. So he stayed in Florence. Um, here in the next image are the artists with whom he studied. On the left, Hiram Powers. He lived at his villa for a while. And on the right, Thomas Ball, who at that point was working on, uh, or had just finished a sculpture of Abraham Lincoln, which was going to be cast for this, the controversial sculpture of Lincoln and the rising or kneeling slave in Washington, D.C., debates about which have been swirling uh, around. Well, he loved working with Ball. Um, as you see from the next image, he got right into character. He became a bohemian artist in Italy. Uh, he had a few commissions there, but his major work, his major project was the next image, The Awakening of Endymion which was one of the failures of his career, one of the few failures. He never really sold it. It wound up in someone's yard in Concord. He got home in 1877, a kind of a more mature man, as you'll see in the next image. And as his boat pulls into Boston Harbor, he, uh, he hears a call for his name. Uh, Daniel French, please report to the lower deck. And there waiting for him was a revenue cutter at the disposal of his father, who you'll see in the next image. Judge French was now an assistant secretary of the treasury. And he told Dan this astonishing news as the, as the revenue cutter with the, with the mail that the ship brought back to Boston uh, on its deck sped into the harbor Dan got the message from his father, we're not moving back to Concord with the family. We're now settled in Washington. Come and be with us or be in Concord alone. Well, I think Dan missed his family. You'll see in the next slide, one of the first things he did was a bust of his own father. But he agreed to go to Washington and establish, try establishing himself there with his father's influence. And um, he got some work but not a great deal of work. The next image um, will give you an idea of the kind of project he was doing on a per diem basis. This one is called Labor Sustaining Art and the Family. And it was designed as the pediment of the new Boston post office. Um, for this, he got a daily wage, not a commission, not a wage that he thought he should get, but it was the only work he could, got, he could get. And not until 1879 did he have another brilliant idea. Well, if you count the Minuteman, which was really the Concord Town Father's idea. In the next slide, you'll see the result, a bust from life of Concord's most famous citizen, 
Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, Emerson loved this uh, bust. He said, this is the way I look when I shave or the, the, the further along you get, the uglier it looks. Um, the kind of remarks that Abraham Lincoln used to give to sculptors as they were proceeding with life works of, of him. Um, it was another great success, very well reviewed. And he was again launched now back home working on commissions. I guess his earliest specialty as you can see in the next image, were, were statues for colleges. Kind of an odd specialty, but lucrative. One of the earliest was arranged by his father, who knew influential people in Washington, and knew that a, a sculpture was needed for Gallaudet College, the college for those with hearing loss and, and hearing, uh, the absence of hearing. He almost lost this commission in the midst of it, uh, be, because uh, Augustus St. Gaudens, among others, thought it should go to a non-hearing sculptor. French actually wrote to St. Gaudens and said, don't do that, or, or you will have me after you for the rest of your life. Actually, they became friends and friendly competitors, and St. Gaudens backed off. This was the result in the next image of the Gallaudet Memorial on campus unveiled in 1889. It took him a while to get it produced. It was a very sensitive sculpture of the original Gallaudet for whom the college was named, signing to a deaf child. Well, the next one he did was uh, pretty famous and it was unveiled earlier. It's of course, John Harvard at Harvard Yard. Here it is in its original location in front of Memorial Hall. It was later moved at uh, French's insistence to its current location in the yard. What I think your audience may find interesting, particularly about this work, is that French not only researched it intensely, but he researched it publicly. People of the day seem to have been absolutely astonished that a sculptor could do a work um, of a person for whom there were no surviving photographs or paintings. And of course, John Harvard lived in the Pilgrim Age, so what did French do? He did intense research. The newspapers covered the work. And where did he do it? Of course, at the Massachusetts Historical Society. I write in the book of his visits there to find out as much as he could about attire of that age. The John Harvard was another great triumph. And of course, it remains an icon of the college today. Although since it's uh, both the first stop on a college tour, if there are still college tours, hopefully there will be again, and also a pit stop, uh, a notorious pit stop for students who have had too much beer on the weekend. One uh, online guide to the Harvard tour says uh, that the statue is, um, now I've forgotten the term, but, um, animated by day and urinated by night, something like that. Um, rather vulgar description, but I couldn't help sharing it with you. The next work uh, in New York is Alma Mater uh, in front of the Low Library at Columbia University. This statue was almost damaged when a, uh, a bruising young baseball player on the Columbia team hit a home run so far out of the old stadium that it landed right at the at the feet of alma mater, um, and of course, some of you may be able to guess that that ball player was Lou Gehrig, who soon enough joined the Yankees. Alma mater, actually, you might know want to know in this age of iconoclasm, was targeted for destruction by the weathermen, by the weathermen underground in 1969. Uh, it was the first story I covered as, a, as a, a young cub reporter for a New York Weekly. And the throne of the statue was in fact damaged by an explosive device. The statue itself was undamaged. The president of Columbia had it taken away as if to punish the students. And when it returned, it had been shed of its gilding. It was originally a gold leaf sculpture. I think it looks rather better now. 
installed back on campus. French's next specialty was the Civil War. Many sculptors of the day took to the Civil War as a subject. Um, French did this really handsome brooding sculpture of Ulysses S. Grant for Philadelphia. And as you'll see in the next image, Joseph Hooker for Boston. And uh, it's outside of the Boston State House to this day. But the next image shows him what it looked like on its dedication day. As you can see, Civil War dedications were a very big deal indeed at the turn of the century, north as well as south. I know we've all been focused on Lost Cause and Jim Crow statuary, but the North had its share of major ceremonies and memory events like the Hooker. Here's another work in progress, a memorial that French sculpted now at his New York studio, a memorial to the Melvin brothers, three brothers from Concord who had lost their lives during the Civil War, funded by the surviving brother. And you'll see it next in C2 at Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Concord, really one of the most beautiful memorials to the Civil War or to any subject, um, now known by its uh, nickname, I guess, Mourning Victory. As you see the symbol of victory with a laurel wreath cloaked uh, in, a, in a drape of sadness. One other work worth noticing, because it's a Boston work, is French's tribute to the Boston sculptor Martin Milmore. You'll see it in the next image, there it is. Um, it's uh, it's uh, a tribute to a sculptor who died young, and it's a pretty daring and uh, accomplished work of the angel of death, and there are some of those wings that William Brewster provide models for. The angel of death actually taking the hand of a young sculptor um, who is working on a sphinx that is also in Boston. And this is the, the Millmore Memorial in Forest Hills Cemetery. Uh, worth noting one more work from Boston, the uh, O'Reilly Memorial, because it, it stands um, in, on the Fenway near the Massachusetts Historical Society. It was a much remarked on work at its dedication in 1897 because it contained not only a realistic portrait of O'Reilly, but these uh, figures of poetry and inspiration and history. Again, um, at this point, French is going between uh, symbolic figures and realistic lifelike figures with great facility and ease. I suppose he reached his early apogee, as you'll see in the next slide, in uh, this extraordinary image uh, for the World's Fair in Chicago in 1896. Taller than the Statue of Liberty, uh, really meant as a rival of the Statue of Liberty in New York. Alas, it was made of flammable materials and like so much of uh, Chicago, subject to fire, it indeed burned down. Uh, but a smaller gilded version stands in a park in Chicago it will soon be front and center because the Obama Library is being built behind this um, once quite famous statue. At this point, French is so wealthy that he buys a farmhouse in, um, in, in, um, in Massachusetts. He moves to uh, this, this gorgeous setting, not a gorgeous house, but as you'll see in the next house, in the next slide of the house he built with uh, the design of Henry Bacon, who had been his designer at the Chicago World's Fair. This is Chesterwood um, in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, a gorgeous home open to the public. And I wanna say that um, I'm particularly grateful for Chesterwood, to Chesterwood for commissioning the book. Uh, the next slide shows the studio that still exists there and is open to the public, where French did most of his great works after 1900, including, as you'll see in the next slide, you see French at work on an equestrian portrait of George Washington, which is visible today in the next image outside the uh, Place Diana in Paris.
next image and you will see it in C2 in Paris where it stands today. Demonstrators now tend to put the, uh, the tricot on the top of the sword. How they get there, I'm kind of afraid to know. Another big project for New York City were sculptures at the Custom House, uh, the great tax revenue building in Lower Manhattan. This is uh, the continent of, the, of America. And you'll see in the next slide how it looks as a statue today made of granite. The next one is Africa, sleeping Africa, uh, not subtle. And here it is in C2 today. If we can take a look at the next slide, you'll see the custom house. Uh, and there are the four statues in front, uh, Europe, Asia, Africa, and America. The Africa statue uh, being talked about today, is it appropriate in this day and age? I might add that this is the very area where patriots pulled down the statue of King George III in July 1776. So it, the area has kind of a history of iconoclasm. The next image shows French as the prosperous turn of century public sculptor. And the next image, his first great Lincoln work, the standing Lincoln of Lincoln, Nebraska, supposed to be ready for the Lincoln Centennial in 1909, but it was done uh, in, in 1912 with the words of the Gettysburg Address on the plinth behind him. By this time, as you'll see in the next slide, French is at the head of the table, literally. He is the chairman of the National Commission of the Fine Arts. And their great project in around 1912-13 is finding a site for, a sculptor for, and a designer for the long-awaited National Lincoln Memorial. And you may be interested to know that it was quite a struggle to agree upon a site. One of the sites you'll see in this next slide that was talked about was Union Station in Washington. Here's how it looked at the turn of the century. Another uh, next slide is the US Capitol where they built uh, another equestrian of General Grant instead. Yet another was the Soldier's Home in Washington DC, Lincoln's own summer retreat. Another, the Naval Observatory. This is an aerial view. And another, Meridian Park, outside on the outskirts of Washington. Um, Speaker Joe Cannon, who you'll see in the next image, who had, who had seen Abraham Lincoln from the flesh, he was the powerful Speaker of the House, kind of the Nancy Pelosi of his day, uh, was told that what they really wanted, what the commission really wanted, was West Potomac Park. And Joe Cannon said, um, I will never let a statue of my hero be built in that damn swamp. Instead, he recommended this site, um, Arlington Cemetery on the Virginia side, on the Confederate side of the river. Well, cooler, hells, uh, cooler heads prevailed, led by this man, Henry Bacon, who was awarded the Architectural Commission without much competition, and who designed, as you'll see in the next slide, the temple that we are now so familiar with, with the great steps ascending to its atrium. Uh, Bacon had only one choice uh, for sculptor. He was gonna repay his long partnership with Daniel Chester French on a number of public monuments. And French, uh, here you see Bacon in the next slide, drawing French's concept for a seated Lincoln. But be sure that the idea was French's um, in fact, some people wanted to do a replica of Augustus St. Gordon's standing Lincoln from Chicago, and French was very concerned about it, and they started quite the campaign to shoot that idea down, even though it would have been cheaper. French went to work with the usual brand of research that he applied to most of his great works. He began looking at Lincoln photographs assembled by the great Frederick Hill Meserve, one of the great early collectors of Lincoln photographs. He, he bought a copy of Lincoln's life mask, um, which um, we'll see in the next image. He began 
putting nails in kind of ghoulishly, but not really. That was the way he took measurements. He bought a set of the plaster casts of Lincoln's hands that the sculptor had made. These are pretty famous collectibles in their own right. And then he took casts of his own hands to show, um, to position the hands as he wanted them to look in the statue itself. And somehow he just went right to work on a three foot model. You'll see it here. I'm sorry, this is actually the smaller clay model. And really except for repositioning the legs and the hands a bit and adding a cloak to the back, this was the Lincoln Memorial, just from first concept. Next you'll see the three foot model very close to the final realization. And next, the six foot model with Daniel Chester French standing proudly before it. In fact, he's tucked in his little original model into the, the, uh, the space beneath Lincoln's right leg to kind of show off a little bit. Well, he, re he was commissioned originally to do an 11 foot sculpture in marble for the atrium. But when he went to visit the unfinished memorial, he realized to his horror that it was too small. And he built a head, a plaster head in the size that a 19 foot sculpture would require. Congress said they're not gonna give the extra money to French or to the commission to make a bigger statue. But French hung and suspended this head from the atrium, called people in to see it and won their agreement to proceed with the larger work. The actual carving was done by this next group, an, a, a talented team of Italian immigrants, the Picciarilli brothers, uh, who were so in sync with each other's work that they were able to hand the sculpting materials to each other when, when the one proceeding needed a break. They're the ones who actually carved the Lincoln Memorial in the Bronx, New York, right near where Yankee Stadium is today. I know my Boston audience will not want me to say the words Yankee Stadium, especially the morning after uh, the Yankees clinched a playoff spot. But anyway, um, that's where the Lincoln Memorial was built in 36 slabs uh, of marble, some interior pieces, some exterior. And in the next image from a magazine of the day, you'll see work being done on the actual head from the model head. And in the next shot, you'll see French's six foot model on display at the Pizzarilli studio. French always got there for his inspections when lunch was being prepared. Uh, the next slide shows one of those jolly meals of pasta prepared by one of the brothers every day. Well, in around 1920, this, the blocks of marble are taken to Washington, D.C. and assembled. Uh, you'll see the work in progress in the next image. In fact, they were never shown, they were never assembled until they got to the Lincoln Memorial. So it must have been an extraordinary experience. That's uh, Henry Bacon and the Pichirilli brothers at work there, hoisting the pieces in place. And finally, you'll see uh, French and Henry Bacon standing in front of the assembled statue. Ladders set up so Daniel Chester French, who was by then 70 plus years old, could still scamper up those ladders and burnish pieces and highlights of the sculpture that he wanted fixed. Finally, the date is set for a dedication, Memorial Day 1922. French stays away for most of the preceding period. Uh, he goes back to Italy, and you'll see in the next image, uh, gives the, his daughter away at a, at a Sicily wedding. Um, he just doesn't want to be part of it. Again, I think the anxiety is overcoming him. But as you'll see in the next slide, Memorial Day 1922, on a very hot day, a huge throng assembles in that one-time swamp to see the dedication. And... Uh, the chairman of the Memorial Commission, who you'll see in the next image, William Howard Taft, gives one of the dedicatory addresses. This is a great silhouette photograph. Newsreels exist of this, if anyone wants to Google them. 
you can actually see highlights of the memorial on film, silent film. Um, one of the sad notes of the dedication is that it was segregated. In fact, um, African Americans who came early to the dedication to get good seats were rousted out of their seats by Washington DC mounted police who pushed them right to the edge of the reflecting pool, which you see in this image. Um, and they, uh, some just left, others wrote about it in the black press with, with quite a bit of resentment and hurt that a statue of the great emancipator was unveiled figuratively at a segregated event. There was one African-American speaker, you'll see him in the next image, Robert Russa Moton, the principal of the Tuskegee Institute, Booker T. Washington's successor. He was the only black face on that, on that portico with all white guests. And in fact, not only was he the only representative of the black community, his speech was subjected to the censorship of the Harding administration, which told him to excise a criticism of, of the absence of full black rights and citizenship as Lincoln had requested at the end of his life. Uh, they told him he, would, he should either censor that or give up his speaking position. Not until 75 years later was the full speech read by Moton's successor as principal of Tuskegee. As you'll see in this next image, a very white affair indeed. President Warren Harding at left, at right is Speaker Joe Cannon. And just go back once, one more moment to that image because it's noteworthy that Robert T. Lincoln, the only surviving child of Abraham Lincoln, bearded but not very Lincoln-esque, was also at that dedication. And now we can go to the next image of the Lincoln Memorial after its dedication. And then the next image, um, a problem with lighting that French soon solved by getting a study by the General Electric Company to repair the, the errant lighting. It seems that while he was in Italy, they covered up a skylight at the top that he had calculated would set light on in a certain way. And let's look at the next image after the lighting problems were cured. It really looks quite beautiful. And yet it remained a symbol of sectional but not racial reconciliation until 1939, 17 years, when Eleanor Roosevelt directed that Marian Anderson, the great opera singer, who was denied the opportunity to sing at the Daughters of the American Revolution Constitution Hall in Washington, that she be allowed to sing from the Lincoln Memorial. And as you'll see in the next image, she did so before a fully integrated crowd in 1939. Suddenly the Lincoln Memorial took on extraordinary new meaning as a symbol of not just sectional, but also of racial reconciliation. Never more so, as you'll see in the next slide, than, uh, than in August of 1963, when America's greatest civil rights leaders assembled for the March on Washington. Um, you see uh, Roy Wilkins at the bottom right and to his right, Dr. Martin Luther King and Roy Wilkins far left in that front row is Whitney Young. Look at the top row, third from the left on the top row is none other than Congressman John, future Congressman John Lewis, who that day would become the youngest speaker at the march. And in the next slide, of course, the iconic moment, the I Have a Dream speech, which began with a reference to the great statue of the Lincoln Memorial and to Lincoln. Well, the Lincoln Memorial has been a touchstone ever since in various ways. Richard Nixon paid a, a, an unusual secret visit to meet war protesters. Fidel Castro visited. Harry Truman addressed the NAACP from its steps. And in recent years, it's become a place where presidents elect spend their final nights at rallies before their inaugurations. Let's just run through some of them. The first, I've emphasized the statue here. Let's look at another. 
and another and another. Um, president spoke earlier, I mean your president, not our president, president of the Historical Society spoke about a forthcoming exhibition of cartoons. I have a few to show you because the memorial has also figured in cartoons. This very famous cartoon um, of the statue in mourning after the assassination of John Kennedy in 1963. There are endless versions of this next cartoon um, of the statue greeting Barack Obama with fist bumps or other greetings and high fives uh, in 2009. Uh, don't do the next slide yet, I wanna set it up um, in a vaudevillian way. Yes, there is a cartoon of the Lincoln Memorial reacting to the election of Donald Trump. And this is it. One of shock. <laughs> Robert Lincoln and Daniel Chester French both spent much time visiting the memorial. Robert Lincoln, if we look at the next slide, would stop uh, often and look at it and say, isn't it beautiful? And Daniel Chester French himself visited until he was an elderly man and could no longer travel. It's now the biggest visitor attraction in Washington, of course, French's triumph and really our national triumph as we have redirected national memory to the most important issue that still faces and confronts and tests America, and that is racial reconciliation and ending systemic racism. I want to end, in fact, with this next slide and with a quote. It's a quote from a, uh, a young man who was a history student and also a porter at a Washington hotel. And he was about to leave to go to college full time and leave his job. He was also a great admirer of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, his name was Langston Hughes. And I wanna end with his wonderful ob observations about the Lincoln Memorial. Let's go see old Abe sitting in the marble and the moonlight, sitting lonely in the marble and the moonlight, quiet for 10,000 centuries, old Abe, quiet for a million, million years, quiet and yet a voice forever against the timeless walls of time, old Abe. Thank you. A wonderful presentation, um, and we certainly have learned a lot more about Daniel Chester French, um, and I think a little bit more about um, the country. Um, so we have quite a few questions here. Um, so we can just start out with some of the ones that came in early. Um, and these don't go in any particular order, but uh, Roy says, can you tell us something about Daniel Chester French's medals art? In a book I wrote about the Pulitzer Prizes, I was interested to find that he produced the Pulitzer gold medal picturing Ben Franklin and a shirtless printer on the obverse. Uh, thanks. Right, he did, he did medal and medallion art, uh, not quite as uh, ubiquitously as uh, his rival St. Gaudens did, who of course, you know, spent a good, had a, just an amazing level of production. And I think Roy has, has hit on the most famous one and that is the two-sided medal that shows a Pulitzer on one side and Franklin at his printing press uh, on the other. I think that's the most notable example. Well, actually, uh, on that point, uh, Danny wrote, was there an active rivalry between French and St. Gaudens? There, there was in life. Um, they really were um, quite you know, not that much different in age, but St. Gaudens had, uh, sort of assumed the role of senior sculptor. I think it sometimes irked Dan, although Dan um, visited um, St. Gaudens home, Aspit, did some work there, sort of loved the idea of an artist colony so much that he started looking for one of his own and ended up to his, um, you know, to his delight at, uh, at Chesterwood. Uh, and, you know, St. Gaudens uh, objected briefly, as I mentioned, to his Gallaudet work. The, the people who commissioned Alma Mater brought 
St. Gaudens in to look at his uh, statue and uh, complained about a little bit of it. And French felt he had to make some adjustments. In fact, on, the, on his wedding day, supposedly, or not, not long before his wedding day, St. Gaudens issued some criticism and, and uh, it, it upset him terribly. And he felt he had to go back to work rather than, than on a honeymoon or at least postponed his wedding a bit as his wife later complained until the hottest day of the year in Washington, D.C. Um, in later years, I think there was a thawing out, although when William Sherman died, um, St. Gordon called on French to visit uh, his home, and there a, a, a death mask was made that St. Gordon later used for his equestrian statue in front of Central Park in New York City, but St. Gordon directed French to actually do the work. So he was still a student with the master. St. Gaudens died early. French by then was a member of the board of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And he very generously started and as a trustee then, he was also really the American sculpture curator in charge. And he started directing, collecting, and collected a ton of St. Gaudens works. The Met's collection of St. Gaudens is really um, owed to the prescience and the generosity and the lack of rivalry uh, or the spirit of rivalry by, uh, uh, by, by French. And he organized the first St. Gaudens exhibition at the Met as well. So, you know, I think it helped their relationship to be blunt about it from the French side that St. Gaudens died early. Had, had he survived, I think they would have competed maybe even for the Lincoln Memorial. Well, actually, touching on uh, your mention of the delayed wedding, uh, Mrs. Cahill uh, said, what was French's fam family's life like? Well, he had a very close family. Uh, his, uh, his mother died young, but he was uh, very happy to have uh, a very uh, benevolent and understanding stepmother, much in... Uh, the manner of his most famous subject, Abraham Lincoln, who was blessed by a sympathetic and encouraging stepmother. He was very close to his father. Um, uh, his father uh, was, remained a public official for a long time and helped Dan meet people, get commissions. Um, his uncle was Benjamin Brown French, who was the commissioner of public buildings in the Lincoln administration, also very influential and helpful to his, his young nephew. Um, eventually, French married <coughs> his first cousin, Mary French. I'm not complaining about it, except for the fact that it made describing the family very difficult. There are a lot of Frenches in the French family. There's Judge French. Um, uh, French's brother was the founding director of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, his wife was Mary French French. Uh, so it's, it's, it, it's complicated. But it was a very creative and uh, uh, high achieving family and very nurturing of Dan, very supportive. I will say one little family tidbit is that Dan did not get engaged until his father died. His father died literally in his arms. He sort of stumbled into the Concord house one day uh, and just uh, had a heart attack and passed or a stroke and died. And then dad told his uh, stepmother that he was going to marry his first cousin, which he also researched. He researched all scientific knowledge he could about first cousins marrying. Oh, at least the, the research carried through to every part of his life. <laughs> so that was probably too much information, but as long as I was asked. <laughs> Uh, Maureen wrote, uh, is it true that he did not sculpt the horse on the Hooker statue? Uh, yes. Okay. Great, great question. I should have said it. Beginning from the time that he, uh, that he did uh, the very latest, the George Washington, he had a sculptor who worked on the horses. He just, he didn't like doing them. He didn't think he was that great at doing them. And he found a partner to do the equestrian. So he didn't do the Hooker. He didn't do uh, the grant and he didn't do uh, George Washington for Paris which by the way I should have mentioned is outside the Guimet Museum uh, on that uh, 
the Place Diana in Paris. So uh, I, I must admit, I passed it by many times in Paris without wondering why there was George, why George Washington was there. But it was a gift uh, uh, of to cement American French friendship. Um, Bruce wrote, uh, what happens to his failure that ended up in a yard in Concord? I'm sorry, what was the beginning of Gavin? Uh, what happened to his failure, the sculpture that he uh, made in Europe and brought back but was never able to sell? Oh, uh, oh. Ended up in a, in a yard in Concord. Um, that's a good question. I don't, I think it's now in the collection at Chesterwood. So it was rescued from this ignominious. It was a garden sculpture. I shouldn't just say a yard, but it was a. It was used like a jockey in a garden, but it was rescued. Um, I'm I'm pretty sure it was rescued. Great. Uh, and Gretchen wrote, uh, "We're lucky to have some amazing uh, collaborative projects in Boston between Daniel Chester French and McKean Mead, McKim Mead and White um, here in Boston, the Parkman Memorial in Jamaica Plain, uh, and the doors to the Boston Public Library. Could you speak to their partnerships?" Yeah, um, his two architects of choice were McKim Mead and White, um, and uh, he of course did the Stanford White memorial ultimately in New York City and Bacon. Um, so there were, there were lots of partnerships. I don't have a list of them offhand, but the Parkman is a good one. He had uh, that, that statue. I, the last I heard about the Parkman was that um, it had been uh, through, through some rough times, maybe even some vandalizing. So not, I'm not familiar enough with, with all the areas of Boston to know uh, whether it's been secured and uh, some elements of it were, in fact, removed at one point and replaced. Uh, but he had really fruitful collaborations with architects throughout. Um, and Karen wrote, did French do some of the sculpting on the Lincoln statue or was it essentially all done by the Italian brothers? Well, I'm not gonna say he wasn't the sculptor. I'm just gonna say he wasn't the carver. Um, French worked after, you know, that was his method. He would do a model. He would supervise an enlargement. He would supervise the casting. And then he would send, the, you know, eventually it would be a full-size cast. Or in the case of the Lincoln Memorial, never got bigger than a nine-foot or 11-foot, a nine-foot cast, I think. And then his carvers or his foundry would take over. Um, you know, he wasn't Michelangelo. He's not, he doesn't get a block of marble and spend 20 years with a chisel and a hammer. But he creates the concept and he supervises the carving. So where the Picciarillis were concerned, he spent time at the, uh, at the, uh, the this atelier in the Bronx uh, correcting and he would do burnishing work and, re and work on details himself. In fact, the George Washington sculpture uh, when it was installed in Paris, first it was lost, which made him very anxious. Then it was found in the, on the river somewhere in a waiting to pay its, its import duties. And when it was installed, he realized he didn't like the, the, some of the carving because it was, in two, it was in lower relief than it would have wanted for a statue on the pedestal that supported it. So he climbed up and tried to do some last minute work. That's why at Chesterwood, he ultimately built a second studio on a hill so that when his work was wheeled outside, he could scamper down the hill and look up at a work uh, at the approximate height it would be once it was installed. It made his, his I don't even remember what the question was, but I ventured a field here a bit. Um, so, so yes, he was present and he did corrections in detail, but the Peach release did the carving. Um, you know, scaled up versions of French's models. Um, so, uh, Alan, uh, I believe that you can unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. It's not a question, it was just a comment uh, that the uh, Chicago World's Fair is 1893, not 1896. Good, good comment. I'm sorry you were recognized, but you're absolutely right. Thank you. <laughs> of course, it's the, it's the, it's the anniversary of Columbus's quote discovery unquote. And it took a year, lo a year longer than was planned. Yes. And um, 
all of it except for the uh, the uh, art institute and the museum of uh, natural history sort of vanished now. As a former resident of Chicago, it, it still holds a, a a large place in the city's uh, in the city's history. Uh, so. Um, we have a few, oh, maybe one more question here. We have a lot of comments about it being a great presentation, so we're Thank sorting you. through them. Um, but um, let's see. Uh, there was an anonymous at attendee who asked if Daniel Chester French designed his own burial place. Mm, um, no. It's a pretty <laughs> modest place. I think his daughter, who was also a sculptor, um, did the decorative work on, on the, on the, uh, on the grave, which I visited. I have visited. Great. It's a rather morbid place to end, but. <laughs> um, well, there's also been a couple of people who've written in to say that the Parkway Memorial is actually in beautiful shape. So we can that's end great. Uh, hopeful note that, that that's actually uh, has not, if it did weather any ill will or it is, is recovered. So I mean, the good news also, Gavin, is that, the Boston um, Post Office is long gone, but Boston made sure that those sculptures, those um, sculptures that were on top of those buildings were rescued and put in park settings. So those survive as well. And they sort of give an interesting perspective of people who are saying that sculptures should be taken down from pedestals and put in, in, in parks or cemeteries, or this gives a good example of how the angle changes quite a bit and the sculptures look a little severe, uh, almost cartoonish because they were carved to be seen from well below in the street. But kudos to Boston for saving, for saving those works. Well, um, I would just like to thank you uh, for uh, coming and joining us and sharing this uh, great presentation. Um, and before we go, we do uh, hope people who enjoyed the program will buy a copy of your book. Uh, we'd also point out that this book is available at uh, your average local bookstore, and um, we hope people will support independent local bookstores. Um, one that we have a particular fondness for is uh, Poor Square Books, um, and they do have the book in stock. So if people are looking for a place to buy it, I hope they'll consider that. Um, and then just finally to say that uh, in these unusual times, uh, we do hope people will consider uh, supporting MHS. And I believe Catherine uh, may be rejoining us to say a similar thing. <laughs> You're doing great, Gavin. No, no, no. I just wanted to say this was fabulous. And I have to say in the world of Zoom, I really appreciate the pictures. Thank you so much. Hope everyone has a great evening. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Bye.